Okay, good morning everybody. Uh, welcome to another session on thoracic surgery. Uh, difficult times we are all facing, but we'll try and go through the topics and try and keep your spirits up, okay? So today's topic that I'm going to talk on is, is uh, another one which causes a lot of problems for uh, young uh, people, uh, young thoracic surgeons, particularly when they're going into the exams because they always find that it's kind of difficult to understand what is the anatomy at the thoracic outlet and you know what are the difficulties that uh, you face when you are uh, trying to assess a patient with thoracic outlet. So today I'll take you through a basic anatomy of the thoracic outlet. Actually the word is inlet, it's not an outlet, it's an inlet. The outlet of the thorax is actually the diaphragm, uh, but uh, you know, traditionally and historically, everybody's used the word outlet, hence I'm going to stick to that term, term. But really, you have to understand that it is the thoracic inlet. Things are going in, things are not going out. So that is something that uh, is sort of one of the first points that I'd like to make. Uh, okay. So thoracic outlet has three main things which you have to understand. Now, I've put it straight out. I want everybody to understand the three main concepts of thoracic outlet where the trouble is. One is called as the interscalene triangle. One is called as the costoclavicular space. And then there's one which is called as the subcorocoid space, which is deep to the pectoralis minor muscle. Okay, so these are the three spaces that you need to understand. And you need to understand what exactly is happening and what are the structures uh, in these areas which are getting compromised because of reduced space. Now, these are narrow areas, so we do understand that uh, the amount of uh, structures going through, even if there's a little bit of inflammation or anything that causes a little bit of obstruction, the outcomes are quite severe for the patient. So this is what is called as the thoracic inlet, and this is the area that we need to understand. I'll show you a few diagrams to show you a few uh, structures around that area. So this is the area that we are talking about, okay? And the muscles that you need to remember are scalenes. These are important muscles. This is anterior and middle scalenous muscle. And then let me go here and explain it on this basis. So if you look carefully at this diagram, this is the most important diagram, okay? So here is your anterior scalene muscle and that's the middle scalene muscle. And this triangle, which is formed here between the anterior and the middle scalene muscle is called as the scalene triangle. Can you see this clearly, this area? So any inflammation of the scalene muscle will actually cause a compression of the brachial plexus, okay? Can you see the brachial plexus is clearly coming out from this area and that is a very tight area. So anything that causes uh, compression or, or inflammation and the commonest thing that causes inflammation of the scalene muscles is a road traffic accident and whiplash injury. When you're sitting in your car and you are driving or you're stopped and somebody comes and hits you from the back because you are not anticipating the crash, your muscles are in a relaxed state suddenly your body starts to move forward, the seat belts hold you, holds you back, and then your head gets whipped back. When the head gets whipped back, it hits the headrest. So there is an acceleration, deceleration injury that happens. And the commonest area that gets affected is in this area, the scalenous muscle. And that is why you get what is called as a whiplash injury. And very often people who have whiplash injury will complain of paresthesia or numbness or tingling in their hand in the affected side. So this is the area that causes them the problem. Okay, everybody clear about this? This is a very easy area to understand. It's called as the scalene triangle. Okay, the next area that is of significance in the uh, in thoracic outlet is this area. Okay, and this is called as the costo so this is the first rib, clavicular. So this is a costoclavicular junction. And here there is a muscle called a subclavius. Can you see this muscle subclavius? Am I pointing it out? Can you see it? Subclavius means below these, 
subclavian area. Okay, so subclavius and costoclavicular. So below the clavicle, so subclavius. Okay, this area has got not only the nerves. Here you've got only the nerves, but in this area, you've got the first rib here below. You've got the clavicle on the top, and you've got the vein, artery, and the nerve. Three of them passing in very close proximity to each other. So it's a very narrow and a very tight area. And anything that causes a problem either with the first rib or causes a problem with the subclavius muscle below the clavicle or causes a problem with the clavicle will actually cause inflammation in this area and will cause compression. And the compression from this area will be three levels. Three different types of symptoms can happen. One can be neural symptoms because of compression of the brachial plexus. One could be arterial symptom because of compression of the subclavian artery. And one can be venous compression because mm -hmm. of, sub, of compression of the subclavian vein and the axillary vein. So there's a back effect. Because, uh, this is the outflow of the vein. It's coming back into the body from here, uh, back to the heart from here. So there will be a lot of back effect when the vein is compressed. So be, based on this, there are three types of thoracic outlet syndromes. Okay, the main three types are neurological, entos, arterial, and venous, vetos. TOS is T-O-S, okay, thoracic outlet syndrome. So that's the second area that is of concern, okay? And then you come to the third area of concern. And the third area of concern is here is your scapula. Mm -hmm. The scapula is giving out the coracoid process. And on the coracoid process is attached the pectoralis minor muscle. Can you see that? So this is called as a sub coracoid or subpectoralis area. And out here again, you've got the vein, artery and bronchus, uh, vein, artery and uh, uh, nerve passing in very close proximity in a tight uh, space. So anything that causes inflammation or anything that causes a fracture of the coracoid process or anything that causes uh, narrowing of this area, will cause uh, symptoms related to neurological, arterial, or maybe venous. We don't know which one will show up, but any one of these can show up. So here's another diagram of the three, just to highlight. So is this diagram clear to everybody? This is the most important diagram to understand. If you understand this diagram, everything else of thoracic outlet is absolutely easy. So here is the scalene muscle. Okay, and here is your brachial plexus coming out from here. Take your pen and paper and draw this diagram just for your own understanding. So draw anterior scapula, draw muscle. Hey, somebody is, please shut your microphone down for God's sake. So here is the brachial plexus. And then here is the artery, subclavian artery. Here is the subclavian vein. That is the second area. That will cause you a problem. There is the clavicle on the top, the cervical, the first rib on the are down here, and the subclavius muscle and the costoclavicular ligament. Okay, there is something here called the costoclavicular ligament between the clavicle and the costal margin. So any of these can cause inflammation and cause problems. And the third one again is the subpectoral space or the subacromial uh, sub space okay there are various names that are described so here is the acromion the coracoid process of the scapula and here is the pectoralis minor joining it and a narrow space between the ribs and this muscle where the vein artery and nerve are passing okay i am repeating this because it is very important to understand this anatomy when you are going to operate on the patient. And it's not an area that the thoracic surgeon frequently visits. So they quite often forget what is the anatomy of this area. Again, same picture to show you the three, subpectoral, costoclavicular, and interscalene triangle, okay? 
is that clear to everybody usually if there is a congenital problem something like a cervical rib or uh, you know a bone or stuff like that then this problem is usually bilateral so if it is uh, more systemic uh, problems then usually it is bilateral <coughs> if it is related to trauma then it might be unilateral okay so very often you may have to operate on one side but actually the patient still has problems on the other side so you may have to go back and operate on the other side and the interval between the two sides of surgery they have said should be kept at around one year because it does take time for the patient to recover from one side but of course if he is severely symptomatic on the other side you can do it sooner than that but traditionally most of us do one side first give them physiotherapy etc and then tell them to come back next year and we do it um, the next year on the other side okay so as i told you and i showed you from the diagram this is called as there are various types of syndromes so the first one is neurogenic toss which is because of compression of the nerves the second one is vascular toss which is compression of the uh, vein vein so not vascular but venous really uh, then you got the arterial and the venous so vascular is when both are compressed arterial is when only artery is compressed venous is when only venous is compressed and there's one more variety where you do not know what is happening it's non specific so in a non specific toss you'll usually have a combination of uh, factors so you can have both neurogenic and vascular symptoms so it's very important to take a nice detailed history because the history will actually give you a good clue as to what is the structure that is compressing and then it will also give you a good clue as to what is the area is it the interscalene triangle is it the costoclavicular area or is it the uh, subpectoral area so it's very important to take a good history and that is why i'll go through some of the symptoms that you get okay so you get uh, in a neurological toss you will get traditionally muscle wasting in the fleshy base of your thumb okay and that specifically is called as gilliard sumner's hand okay you can get numbness and tingling in your arms or fingers depending upon which part of the brachial plexus is affected whether it's the median or it's the ulnar and depending upon whichever the cord of the brachial plexus is affected you will get different distribution of the numbness uh, and tingling in your arms patients also complain of pain or aches in the neck shoulder and hand and it's quite important to understand uh, to differentiate what level of the uh, hand is being affected what level of the shoulder is being affected because that is directly decided by which brachial plexus the upper middle or lower is being uh, compressed you will get a weakening of the grip so these are all neurological symptoms that you usually get uh, if you look carefully at this picture you will see that this thenar eminence is normal but this thenar eminence has got wasting okay so this is a classical findings when it is a neurological toss what about vascular toss vascular toss can be associated with various symptoms directly related to compression of the vascular structure so there's a very nice article published about the spectrum of the arterial comp compression at thoracic outlets uh, it's by lazar greenfield and uh, they they have looked at a large series of their uh, experience over many years and uh, the commonest uh, uh, sorry one of the important symptoms which requires urgent intervention is acute ischemia so for whatever reason if you've got a uh, compression of the vascular structure may be it the artery or the vein or you have developed thrombosis and even worse if you have developed ischemia secondary to embolization then you will get an acute picture and you will have to acutely act on this patient and the action will be two folds one is if there is an embolus or there is a thrombus then you have to anticoagulate the patient and the second thing is to surgically 
release that space so that the patient, uh, so that the vascular compression is, is taken care of. All patients will present with uh, pain, and pain could be in the arm, shoulder, or neck, particularly with increasing in activity. So when you take a history, you've got to take a history of what affects the pain, what activity affects the pain, which position of the hand affects the pain, and that will give you a very good uh, idea about what area you're dealing with. Again, you'll get paresthesia numbness, that is secondary to the neurological things, but also seen in vascular compressions. Uh, hand color changes, coldness, and weakness. Okay, so these are all these are secondary to the vascular changes rather than the neurological changes. Uh, so I told you about cold fingers, hands, or arms, and that's really a worry. If it's a sudden acute cold finger of uh, coldness of the hands and fingers, then think about embolism. Okay, something is embolized. Uh, arm fatigue with activity. I told you about that. Numbness or tingling in your fingers, weakness of the arm or neck, and sometimes when you palpate or the patient may themselves tell you that there is a throbbing lump near the collarbone. Okay, and usually a throbbing lump in the collarbone is a giveaway. It almost sort of it almost sort of tells you that uh, there could be either a pseudo aneurysm formation or an aneurysm formation uh, either distal or proximal to the uh, costoclavicular area okay that's because there is compression there and usually happens when you have trauma or you have fracture of the uh, clavicle uh, and there is uh, healing with a uh, callus formation okay so you got to be careful. The moment somebody says throbbing lump near your collarbone, all your uh, sensors must be up, the antenna must be up, and you should try to figure out very clearly what is the uh, pathology, okay? Venous thromboembolism is, uh, the venous uh, toss is, is quite specific, and you get swelling, you get cyanosis, you get pain, you get heaviness, and this is all in an acute scenario. And very often you will see this in a patient who will have, who will give you a history of sudden uh, excessive uh, exercise or sudden excessive movement. Uh, something like uh, a patient went to a gym and did a lot of weight lifting. And today he lifted more weights than he would have normally lifted. That's one history. Uh, another history could be that the patient will say, uh, I played one hour of badminton today. Normally, I don't play badminton. And so the shoulder movements uh, and the raising the hand over the shoulder uh, causes, aggravates the symptoms. And you will get an acute situation of a venous toss where you will get uh, emboli, thrombosis of the vein and distal emboli. Uh, or, and you will get sudden swelling in the arm. And if it's a chronic process, then you will get collateral veins. Okay, so collateral veins doesn't happen in acute venous thoracic outlet syndrome. It happens in chronic. So if it's a chronic problem and the vein is getting compressed over a period of time and it is forming uh, thrombus, then there is enough time for the system to collateralize it. And then you will see veins, uh, gorging of the veins on the shoulder or on the forearm. And that will again give you an idea as to what is happening. So this is a sort of vascular thing. See, there is a clear cutoff. There is a very clear cutoff. So something is happening, you're really worrying. And if there is a clear cutoff like this, you must, must, must think, is this guy, has he embolized? Is there something else that's happening? So it's a very worrying sign, okay? If you're getting this sort of a symptom, it's a very worrying sign. Even worse is when you're getting bluish discoloration of the tips. Okay, if you're getting bluish discoloration of the tips, really worry about the venous circulation. That means that the artery is okay, but the blood is not coming back. And because of the stasis and because of the um, uh, backflow problems, this there is venous stasis and there's bluish discoloration of the arms. All of this are worrying symptoms. And if you see any of this, you should start to worry as to something is happening on the vascular front and you need to take action quite fast. This is uh, a pseudo aneurysm formation. Look at this, yeah? This throbbing lump I told you about, 
this is uh, following the guy had a fracture of the clavicle and he healed uh, uh, um, and I think he had some surgery done as well over the area. You can see the scar of the surgery. And then he developed this pulsating mass in the sub, uh, supraclavicular area. And that is secondary to obstruction, probably because of the healing of the uh, clavicle and formation of callus. This guy uh, had an acute uh, venous problem uh, because he went to the gym and he did uh, sudden lifting of weights and uh, there was really engorgement of the whole shoulder, engor engorgement of the vein and, uh, sorry about this, uh, engorgement of the veins and, uh, and, and I, I, I've not shown you his distal hand, but there was vascular and ischemic changes. And this particular situation is called as a Paget-Schroeter syndrome. Okay, acute injury causing axillary, subclavian, vein, effort thrombosis. Effort means he did unusual activity. So it could be playing badminton, it could be playing uh, while uh, doing weightlifting or going to gym. The commonest activity is gym, which gives rise to this. So remember this word, paget schroeter syndrome. Okay. So what causes these uh, uh, thoracic outlet syndrome? We know it is anatomic. Uh, we know sometimes you can have different anatomy, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Sometimes it could be posture related. So, you know, you're not really uh, sitting upright. You're scrouching all the time. You're typing on the computer all the time. So the geometry of the neck and geometry of the thoracic outlet changes and because of prolonged repetitive injury you cause uh, compression on these structures it could be trauma very commonly seen in trauma and i told you it's commonly seen after uh, accidents uh, whiplash injury of the neck it could be repetitive actions something like uh, you know typing so people who type and who sit on computers for a long time may actually end up with pain in the shoulders, pain in the arms and uh, ischemic changes. And that might suggest that there is uh, a thoracic outlet syndrome. Most of these will be, you know, the repetitive actions will be early. So it, it, it's not that these guys will need surgery. But um, a lot of this history taking will actually tell you what the problem is. And very often, you really don't need to do anything more than uh, a good physiotherapy and change of posture and, uh, you know, intermittent breaks and things like that. So treatment can be decided on a good history. Sometimes you can get excessive pressure on the joints uh, from uh, uh, seat belts or from, uh, you know, some people work in uh, areas where you've got to put strapping on your chest. Uh, military people work with uh, large, heavy uh, items on the shoulders, uh, military braces, and sometimes that can actually change the geometry of the uh, thoracic outlet and cause repetitive pressure. Particularly people who put on uh, uh, backpacks, uh, it's, 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 uh, it, that causes a change in the geometry, a backward pressure. And what would have normally not caused a compression will end up causing a compression. So heavy backpacks, and heavy things uh, lifted on the shoulder over a prolonged period of time can cause these problems. And sometimes in pregnancy, they have said that there is a uh, subluxation of the joints and things like that, and that may predispose uh, for the bones to settle down and uh, push onto the uh, thoracic outlet. Uh, and also hormonal changes in pregnancy may cause changes in the ligaments and things like that. Uh, the other causes, the commonest uh, thing that we know about is cervical limb. Not the commonest, it, it is one of the causes of, of this uh, problem. It is present in only 1% of the general population. And it is present in less than 10% of patients uh, who present with thoracic outlet. So less than 10% of patients uh, who have a cervical rib may actually give you symptoms. So it's not something that uh, always needs to be removed. If you incidentally find a cervical rib on a chest X-ray in a routine workup, there is absolutely no indication to operate on the patient. You actually have to give yourself time 
Uh, and, um, you know, unless and until it's causing a problem, you do not need to resect the stomach. The other anatomical thing that can happen is an elongated C7 process. You can have an abnormal first rib or a clavicle, which could become abnormal either due to a tumor, any of the bone tumors. You can have a callus formation secondary to a fracture. And all of this will cause compression on the three narrow spaces, but predominantly in two narrow spaces, not the scalene triangle, but definitely costoclavicular. Uh, uh, space and in the subpectoral space. Those are the two areas which can be affected by these uh, by these uh, injuries. Uh, you can have anatomical variation of the scalene muscles. So sometimes the scalene muscle may divide between the branches of the brachial plexus. Uh, some fibers may run anterior. So there could be a bulky uh, anterior scalenous muscle or there could be a bulky middle scalenous muscle. So any of these variations will cause compression at the scalene triangle. Uh, and sometimes you may have an anomalous fibrous band. Uh, so we know about that. Uh, so not, not just having a whole rib, but you may actually just have a fibrous band. And unfortunately, the fibrous band causes compression on the neurovascular structures and uh, that's uh, difficult. Now I'm going to take you through a series of videos uh, which uh, we recorded yesterday uh, to show you all the various tests okay, that you do clinically because this is important in the exam. This is a fantastic case to get in the exam because you have got about seven or uh, 10 tests which you can do on this patient. So like yesterday, uh, Vikas was saying that, you know, with the hand, uh, with the hyperhidrosis, he was really struggling how to examine the hand. Uh, this is a fantastic case. So if you get a thoracic outlet syndrome case in the exam, really say thank you to yourself because it gives you a lot of time to demonstrate your skills of examination. So just listen to these videos and I hope you can hear the voice. Uh, we have recorded this yesterday, thanks to my son who has also participated in this. So here we are, we'll go through this. Sir, the audio is not audible. Yes, yeah, so the audio is not there. Is it not audible? I think you have uh, to your not audio. audible, sir. Okay, just hang on. Just hang on. Hang on. Let me let me just. Uh, uh, oh God, that's a problem again. Hang on. Sorry, just one second. Okay, I apologize for that. Uh, That's a shame because there's a really a lot of audio on it. I think you are connected to your iPods. No, no, no. Oh, yes, that is possible. You're right. You're right. Of course. <laughs> Thank you for asking. Okay, so let me just restart. Sorry about that. Uh, and, uh, there's so much technology on the desk. So when we are recording this meeting, okay, but let me start sharing. I want to share. Yeah, you're right. I was uh, so. Give me one second. I'm very sorry about this. Let me share screen again, and uh, my PowerPoint presentation. Can you guys see my PowerPoint presentation now? Yes, sir. Okay. Come on. I apologize. I don't know why the volume is gone to zero. Um, sorry, guys. Just give me one second. You know, when you use too much technology, it becomes a problem. Play, play, uh, the video from the actual video file. That might work. Come on. 
This is a real shame because these are really good videos that I need you to see. I'm running three screens, you see, so I, I'm making my life difficult. Just one second, okay? If you want, I can play from the actual video screen. We can wait, sir, no problem. Okay, I, I'm very sorry about this. Just give me a few minutes because I've, these are worth uh, seeing. So, rules test. I'm not arranging them in an order, so. The voice is not coming. I don't know what the hell has happened. Uh, the Rolls test is a test for thoracic outlet syndrome. And yes, I can hear. The Rolls test is a test for thoracic outlet syndrome. And according to Shilat et al, 2001, it has a sensitivity of 84% and a specificity of 30%, which means that you'll get a lot of false positive tests, results with this test. According to Watson et al in 2010, the Rose test is testing all three intervals where you get thoracic outlet syndrome. The rose test is performed in sitting or standing position. Ask a patient to abduct the patient to 90 degrees, externally rotate and flex the elbows to 90 degrees. The elbows should be slightly behind the frontal plane. Now ask a patient to open and close the hand for three minutes. The test is positive if your patient experiences Pain, ischemic pain, or, numb, or tingling or numbness of the hand. Also, look for discoloration of the hand. Minor fatigue and distress are not a positive test. Thank you. Today, I'd like to show you the Rights test, which is also known as the hyperadduction test. It is a test used to check for thoracic outlet syndrome. There are a lot of different descriptions of the performance of the Wright's test, which is why we don't find it reliable to give the numbers on the statistical values of this test. The Wright's test is performed in two steps. In the first step, bring your patient's shoulder to 90 degrees abduction, externally rotate and flex the elbow to 90 degrees. In this way, you're stretching the pectoralis minor tendon through which the, the brachial plexus is positive. For the test to be positive, you have to feel for the radial pulse and see for reproduction of symptoms. In the second step, you hyper abduct the shoulder. This way, you're compressing the costoclavicular space. For this test to be positive, for this test to be positive, you have to look for radial ablation and reproduction of the symptoms. In this video, we're going to show you the costoclavicular maneuver, also known as the military brace test for thoracic outlet syndrome. Now, this is a maneuver where I told you that. Imagine that you've got a huge uh, bag on your back. It's a huge backpack. And use of the backpack actually will recreate this test. So watch the video and understand and think as if you've got a huge backpack on your shoulder. Thoracic outlet syndrome is defined as a neurovascular complex, which is due to compression of a brachial, brachial vascular bundle which is the brachial plexus, 
the subclavian artery and the subclavian vessels. There could be compression of the bron uh, brachial vascular plexus in three areas. One is the scalene triangle, one is the costoclavicular junction, or at the angle of the coracoid process. The structures could be compressed by subclavius or the costocoracoid ligament. There is no sensitivity or specificity value associated with this test. This test shows you which positions provoke and relieve the symptoms. The patient is done in a sitting position. The patient is asked to do a scapular retraction, B scapular depression, scapular elevation, and B protraction. Each position is held for up to 30 seconds while the patient rests his forearms on the thigh. You monitor the change in pulse and try to document which position exacerbates or eases the symptom. Different modifications are to perform both arms by the side and hold the position for one minute. You could use military braces to cause backward and downward movement of the shoulder. In this video, we're going to, in this video, we're going to show you the thoracic outlet syndrome is defined. Thoracic outlet syndrome is defined. Thoracic outlet syndrome is defined as a neurovascular symptom complex associated with compression of the brachial bundle, which includes the brachial plexus and or the subclavian vessels. This compression may be caused by several anatomical structures in one or more of the following three compartments, the interscalian triangle, the costoclavicular space, or the retropectoralis minor space. The Cx test, the Cx release test, is supposed to produce a release of the compression of the neurovascular bundle at the uh, three areas. The Cx release test has a specificity of 94.7% when held for one minute and 87.8% when held for three minutes. Don't worry about the details. I will actually share each of these videos online with you. So don't worry. About but there is no data available on the sensitivity of this test. To perform the test, have the patient in sitting position. The physician stands behind the patient, grasps under the forearm, holding the elbow at 80 to 90 degrees, while maintaining the forearm, wrist and hands in neutrals. The therapist then leans the patient posteriorly approximately 15 degrees and then elevates the shoulder girdle. This passive shoulder girdle elevation of both shoulder girdles is held for up to three minutes. This test is considered positive if either a release phenomenon occurs or the patient's familiar symptoms are reproduced. This test is based on the theory of the release phenomenon, which follows decompression, release of the decompression of one or more of the three areas. So what you're doing here is you are lifting the shoulder girdle to release, to physically release the compression. I told you one of the problems is that people uh, have poor posture and they have drooping shoulders. And when you've got drooping shoulders, there is a pull on the clavicle and there is a pull on the uh, first rib. And because of that, there is compression. So what you are physically doing in a Cyrix, Cyrix release test is you are lifting the shoulder up back to neutral position. In fact, beyond the neutral position. And because you're physically lifting up the whole area, you are releasing the compression on the 
on the uh, chest, uh, on the thoracic outlet. that video you are going to play now uh, i just played the sadax video if you want i'll play it again. Uh, the, actually the video was not oh. visible so the, the only description was wrong yeah the videos really yeah we didn't see the video sir. okay i will show you the sadax video did you see the previous video uh, yes, the, sir. Uh, yes sir yes sir the right test yeah yeah the military ab uh, hyper abduction test that we saw okay, let me show you this one more Just one second. I'll, I'll show it to you. Thoracic outlet Can syndrome is defined now? as yeah, a... Yeah, yeah, yes, sir. Yeah, sir. Oh. Thoracic outlet syndrome is defined as a neurovascular symptom complex associated with compression of the brachial bundle, which includes the brachial plexus and or the subclavian vessels. This compression may be caused by several anatomical structures in one or more of the following three compartments, the interscalian triangle, the costoclavicular space, or the retropectoralis minor space. The CDX test, the CDX release test is supposed to produce a release of the compression of the neurovascular bundle at the uh, three areas. The CS release test has a specificity of 94.7% when held for one minute and 87.8% when held for three minutes. But there is no data available on the sensitivity of this test. To perform the test, have the patient in sitting position the physician stands behind the patient, grasps under the forearm, holding the elbow at 80 to 90 degrees, while maintaining the forearm, wrist and hands in neutrons. The therapist then leans the patient posteriorly approximately 15 degrees and then elevates the shoulder girdle. This passive shoulder girdle elevation of both shoulder girdles is held for up to three minutes. This test is considered positive if either a release phenomenon occurs or the patient's familiar symptoms are reproduced. This test is based on the theory of the release phenomenon, which follows decompression, release of the decompression of one or more of the three areas. Okay, so the next test is called as the Morley supraclavicular. Pressure test. This test or the brachial plexus compression test compresses the neurovascular bundle in the supraclavicular fossa. No diagnostic accuracy studies have been conducted reporting specificity or sensitivity. Hence, the clinical value remains questionable. To perform the test, have your patient sit upright with the arms on the side of his body. The examiner then compresses the supraclavicular fossa for 30 seconds. This test is considered positive if there is a reproduction or an aching sensation or atypical pain or paresthesia or tenderness of the area. In some cases, even a palpable hard mass can be palpated in the supraclavicular space and this might give you an indication of a true structural problem which may be causing the thoracic outlet problems. This test, I'm going to show you the Edens test or the military brace test. We're going to, this test actually compresses the neurovascular bundle in the costoclavicular space and hence it's called as a costoclavicular syndrome. But there is no diagnostic accuracy of this space as we don't know the specificity or sensitivity of this test. To perform this test, you have to stand behind the patient, ask your patient to sit straight in a military position with your chest pushed out and shoulders pushed back. The treatment, the physician brings the arms down and straightens the thing and pulls the shoulder back and palpates for the 
radial pulse while the patient is stretching backwards. You feel for the radial pulse. If there is loss of the radial pulse or if there is pain, then this is a positive test. Sometimes the patient is asked to take a deep inhalation and hold his breath, which allows the first rib to go up and cause the compression. Thank you. Did you understand this one? Yeah? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Yeah, it's yes. important that you have to actually yes. ask the guy to take a deep breath in. And when you take, one is you're pushing the hand back and the second is you're asking him to take a deep breath. When you take a deep breath with the chest expanding, the first rib gets pushed upwards. So the clavicle is pushed down, the first rib is pushed upwards and you are actually recreating compression on the, on the costoclavicular area as a result of which you will actually see a loss of radial pulse. Either the radial pulse will become weak or it will completely lose. And more importantly, patient will start getting symptoms of paresthesia or he will start getting symptoms of pain in the hand. Okay? Write down each one of these and I will share all these videos with you. It will not happen at the same time. You will not understand everything but you have to keep going back and looking at each of these videos again and again, okay? So next one is called as the AdSense yes. test, A-D-S-O-N. The AdSense test is designed to decrease the space in the interscalene triangle. Uh, the, specific, the sensitivity is 79% and the specificity is about 76%. So because of the low accuracy values, the it's difficult to tell how accurate this test is. You stand behind the patient. You have the patient put his arms on his lap. You ask the patient to rotate and extend his neck to the tested side. So he does an extension and then rotation. And then he takes in a deep this test is done sorry. for looking for... Sorry about that. I, I, I... Ask the patient to rotate and extend his neck to the tested side. So he does an extension and then rotation. And then he takes in a deep breath and he holds the breath for one minute, uh, for up to 30 seconds. So in this test, you are asking the patient to do movement or rotation of the neck to the affected side. That's important. So you do not rotate to the opposite side. You actually rotate to the affected side. So if you get, if you rotate to the right, you will get a pain to the right. Again, what you're trying to do is stretch the, the scalene muscles. By rotation and extension backwards, you are stretching the scalene muscle, thereby you are collapsing the triangle, the interscalene compartment. By collapsing the interscalene compartment, you will cause compression on the brachial plexus. And as a result of that, you will see changes in the neurology of the hand. The physician actually feels the radial pulse and looks for any change in the radial pulse volume. A modification of this test is when you move the arm six, 15 degrees and feel for the radial pulse with the patient breathing normal. In the first part of the test, the patient is also asked to take in a deep breath and hold his breath. This pushes the uh, first rib against the vascular bundle. Thank you. The deep breath is important to take because the deep breath, as I said again, pushes the first rib up. And by pushing the first rib up, A, you are collapsing the two, uh, uh, the two uh, tangents of the triangle. And by pushing the first rib up, you're, you're bringing the base of the triangle up. So all of these maneuvers add value to your test. The accent test, Pills test is done for looking for supraclavicular tenderness or pain. You get the patient to sit. In this test, you need to use a hammer. 
I'm using my hand because I couldn't find my hammer. But in this test, you have to use a hammer. This test is similar to the one that you use for diagnosing carpal tunnel syndrome. So watch the test. All right. And I'm for looking for supraclavicular tenderness or pain. You get the patient to sit upright and feel for the supraclavicular fossa and then take a hammer and tap gently on the supraclavicular area. If the patient gets tingling or he gets pain, then this test is considered to be positive. The specificity and the sensitivity of this test for thoracic outlet syndrome is only 46% specificity and 52% sensitivity. Hence, uh, the interpretation of the test should be done with caution. So when you do a test for the shoulders and the shoulder girdle, it is very, very, very important to also do the test for the rest of the arms because all problems may not be arising from the thoracic inlet or outlet. A lot of the problems could be arising further down the arms. So I'm just going to go back and quickly enumerate the test and then talk about the hand test. Is that okay with you guys? Shall yes, I repeat sir. some of those tests quickly just for completion? Yes, sir. So yes. the first no. test that you do the is the test. Is test. A, today I'd like yes. to show you the right test. Which is also known as a the first test that you do is the ruse test. Ruse test is recreating the vascular changes. Let me just do it for you. The ruse test is a test for thoracic outlet syndrome. And according to Shilat et al. 2001, it has a sensitivity of 84% and a specificity of 30% which means that you'll get a lot of false positive tests, results with this test. According to Watson et al. in 2010, the ROSE test is testing all three intervals where you get thoracic outlet syndrome. So the ROSE test is to test all the three intervals, that is the interscalene triangle, the costoclavicular junction, and the subpectoralis triangle or junction. The rose test is performed in sitting or standing position. Ask your patient to abduct the patient to 90 degrees, externally rotate, and flex the elbows to 90 degrees. The rose test is a test for thrust. The rose test is performed in sitting or standing position. Ask a patient to abduct the patient to 90 degrees, externally rotate, and flex the elbows to 90 degrees. The elbows should be slightly behind the frontal plane. Now ask a patient to open and close the hand for three minutes. The test is positive if your patient experiences pain, ischemic pain, or, numb, or tingling or numbness of the hand. Also look for discoloration of the hand. Minor fatigue and distress are not a positive test. So here you are actually A, causing compression at the thoracic outlet, but you're also trying to test for venous return. So you are actually opening and closing the hands to push the blood out of the hand back into the uh, subclavian vein. If there is compression of the subclavian vein, your hand will become ischemic because you are trying to push the blood out and there is compression along the line and you're not able to push the hand out. So you will get a color change in the hand if it is a positive test. Did it make sense? Yes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Today, I'd like to show you the right test which is also known as a hyperadduction test. It is a test used to check for thoracic outlet syndrome. There are a lot of different descriptions of the performance of the Rites test, which is why we don't find it reliable to give the numbers on the statistical values of this test. The Rites test is performed in two steps. In the first step, bring your patient's shoulder to 90 degrees abduction 
externally rotate and flex the elbow to 90 degrees. In this way, you're stretching the pectoralis minor tendon through which the, the brachial plexus is positive. For the test to be positive, you have to feel for the radial pass and see for reproduction of symptoms. So this is specifically looking at the subpectoral area. Okay, this is test for subpectoral area. So you really push back 90 degrees up and open and close your hand. Okay, so this is for subpectoral area. In this video, we're going to show you the costoclavicular maneuver. Thoracic outlet syndrome is defined as a neurovascular complex, which is due to compression of a brachial of the brachiovascular plexus in three areas. One is the scaling coracoid process. The structures could be compressed by subclavius or with this test. This test shows you which positions provoke and relieve the symptoms. The patient is done in a sitting position. The patient is asked to do a scapular retraction, B scapular depression, scapular elevation, and B protraction. So four maneuvers to be done with the patient sitting down. Retraction, protraction, depression, elevation. All of the scapula. So you ask him to move the shoulders. And what you're trying to do is move the coracoid process of the scapula against the neurovascular structures. Okay, that's what you're trying to do. So it is the subcoracoid area, the subpectoral area that you're trying to push up and cause compression. So you're trying to reproduce the symptoms. In Thoracic outlet syndrome is defined as a neurovascular symptom complex, triangle, the costoclavicular space, or the retropectoral, and the uh, three areas. The serious release test has a specificity of 94.7% when held for one minute and 87.8% when held for three minutes. Serious but there is no data test. available on the sensitivity of this test. To perform the test, have the patient in sitting position. The physician stands behind the patient, grasps under the forearm, holding the elbow at 80 to 90 degrees while maintaining the forearm, wrist, and hands in neutrons. The therapist then leans the patient posteriorly approximately 15 degrees and then elevates the shoulder girdle. This passive shoulder girdle elevation of both shoulder girdles is held for up to three minutes. So what you're doing here is trying to release the compression that you've got on the, on the, on the, uh, thoracic outlet. This test has a specificity of not the patient in sitting position. The physician stands behind the patient, grasps under the forearm, holding the elbow at 80 to 90 degrees, while maintaining the forearm, wrist, and hands in neutrons. The therapist then leans the patient posteriorly approximately 15 degrees and then elevates the shoulder girdle. This Passive shoulder girdle elevation of both shoulder girdles is held for up to three minutes. This test is considered positive if either a release phenomenon occurs or the patient's familiar symptoms are reproduced. So what you're trying to do is release the symptoms rather than reproduce the symptoms. Occasionally, some patients will have reproduction of the symptoms. But by Cx release test, you're trying to relieve the symptoms so patient will say that he is feeling better, not worse, usually. Thoracic test or the brachial plexus compression test compresses the neurovascular bundle in the supraclavicular fossa. No diagnostic accuracy studies have been 
conducted reporting specificity or sensitivity. Hence, the clinical value remains questionable. To perform the test, have your patient sit upright with the arms on the side of his body. The examiner then compresses the supraclavicular fossa for 30 seconds. This test is considered positive if there is a reproduction or an aching sensation or atypical pain or paresthesia or tenderness of the area. In some cases, in this test, rather than causing the triangle to collapse, you're causing the brachial plexus to push against the narrow area. So you are actually reproducing symptoms by pushing the brachial plexus in a very tight space. Normally, if you do it in you and me, we will not get pain if you push in the supraclavicular area. But in these patients, because it's a very tight space, even a little bit of push actually causes a reproduction of the pain. The other important thing is this allows you to palpate the supraclavicular area. And very often by simple palpation, you may either feel a subclavian artery aneurysm, or you may feel a presence of a cervical rib, or you may feel the presence of a, a callus secondary to a fracture. All these things will give you additional information about the clinical condition of the patient. I'm going to show you the Edens test or the military brace test. We are going to, this test actually compresses the neurovascular bundle in the costoclavicular space and hence it's called as a costoclavicular syndrome. But there is no diagnostic accuracy of this space as we don't know the specificity or sensitivity of this test. To perform this test, you have to stand behind the patient, ask your patient to sit straight in a military position with your chest pushed out and shoulders pushed back. The treatment, the physician brings the arms down and straightens the thing and pulls the shoulder back and palpates for the radial pulse while the patient is stretching backwards. You feel for the radial pulse. If there is loss of the radial pulse or if there is pain, then this is a positive test. Sometimes the patient is asked to take a deep inhalation and hold his breath, which allows the first rib to go up and cause the compression. Thank you. The accent test is designed to decrease the space in the interscalene triangle. Uh, the, specific, the sensitivity is 79% and the specificity is about 76%. So because of the low accuracy value, the, it's difficult to tell how accurate this test is. You stand behind the patient, you have the patient put his arms on his lap, you ask the patient to rotate and extend his neck to the tested side. So he does an extension and then rotation, and then he takes in a deep breath and he holds the breath for one minute, ah, for up to 30 seconds. The physician actually feels the radial pulse and looks for any change in the radial pulse volume. A modification of this test is when you move the arm six, 15 degrees and feel for the radial pus with the patient breathing normal. In the first part of the test, the patient is also asked to take in a deep breath and hold his breath. This pushes the uh, first rib against the vascular bundle. Thank you. Thank you. So let's. This is the. Percussion test. This test is thing. done for looking for supraclavicular tenderness or pain. You get the patient to sit upright and feel for the supraclavicular fossa and then take a hammer and tap gently on the supraclavicular area. If the patient gets tingling or he gets pain, then this test is considered to be positive. Okay, let's look at the carpal tunnel. When we're assessing uh, thoracic outlet syndromes, you've also got to assess the periphery of the hand to make sure that there is no evidence of carpal tunnel syndrome. 
the I'll show you what is called as the Tyndall's test for carpal tunnel syndrome. What you have to do is lay the patient's hand out on a table flat with the wrist facing upwards, and you have to tap on the carpal tunnel. If the patient gets uh, tingling or pain or increased sensitivity, then it is a positive test. And it means that the problem is arising from the carpal tunnel rather than the thoracic outlet. A further modification is the tapping should be done along the uh, distribution of the median nerve. So you start with the index finger and keep tapping down into the wrist and then continue tapping along the flexor area of the arm into the elbow. At any point you get this positive, then it is, uh, if you get symptoms, then it is positive. Uh, there are, uh, the sensitivity is around 60% and the specificity is around 52% of this test. We're now going to demonstrate the modified Allen's test. In the modified Allen's test, you ask the patient to place the hand on a flat uh, surface, and then the patient closes and opens the hand about five to 10 times. You then put a pressure on the radial and the ulnar artery, and again, ask him to squeeze, squeeze a few times. Yeah, leave it open. You now want to scratch, gently release the pressure on the radial artery to look for the revascularization of the hand from the radial side. You repeat the test by asking the patient to again squeeze the blood out of the hand a few times. You then place your hand on it and squeeze again a few times. Hold it straight. And this time you release the ulnar artery and show the refeeling. Usually you look for the reperfusion of the hand and it shows a patent radial or a patent ulnar artery. So I'll show you the second test for uh, looking out for carpal tunnel syndrome because when you're assessing thoracic outlet uh, syndromes, you got to make sure that the pathology is not somewhere else in the arm and the symptoms are not coming from a peripheral area. The uh, carpal tunnel, as you know, lies in the flexi, in the flexor compartment, uh, where it is a very tight compartment and 10 structures pass through the carpal tunnel to go into the hand. Uh, any swelling or any inflammation will actually cause compression on the nerves and the vessels in this area. To do this test, you ask the patient to stand up straight. He's supposed to bend his elbows and flex his wrist and hold the position for one minute. This causes compression on the carpal tunnel and will cause compression on the median nerve. The patient, if it is positive, will get symptoms of tingling, pain, or paresthesia in the area of the thumb, the index finger, and the medial half of the, of the middle finger. Okay, so these are all the various things that you will get. These are the tests that you have to do, okay? But don't forget that all of it may not be because of thoracic outlet syndrome. You've got to be ready for some other, sim other uh, pathologies as well. That is why it is very important to test for the uh, carpal tunnel, to test for median nerve uh, problems, and to test for radial artery and uh, ulnar artery uh, pathologies. The differential diagnosis that you can come up with is that the problem may not be at the thoracic outlet, but the problem could be in the nerve, uh, in the vertebral column. So the patient could have actually a cervical disc prolapse, which might be actually causing compression on the brachial plexus. And that is a different pathology. So the treatment changes if it's a, a vertebral column problem. There could be a problem at the vertebral facet joint, and there could be uh, osteophytes at the vertebral facet joints, which are causing problems. Uh, by compressing the nerve roots. Again, both of these will give rise to a neurological symptoms, which are quite similar to neurological thoracic outlet uh, syndrome. 
So it's very important to differentiate between the outlet problems and the cervical spine problems. You could also have a malignancy present in the thoracic outlet, which is actually causing uh, problems. Very often in clinical practice, we see that people who have pancos tumor, which is called as a superior sulcus tumor, which is actually a tumor coming from the lung. Uh, and very often these patients present with symptoms of pain in the hand on one side. Usually these symptoms will be unilateral and the, the first presenting symptom will be pain in the hand or uh, tingling numbness in the hand. And when you go on to investigate these guys and do a chest x-ray, suddenly you see a mass in the thoracic outlet and then CT scan and subsequent things may tell you that this is actually a pancos tumor. So don't just think about uh, thoracic outlet compression. Also think of other diseases that can cause these problems. You can have peripheral nerve entrapment. You can have the ulnar nerve entrapped in the, at the elbow, or you can have other issues, median nerve entrapment. So very, very important to rule these out as well. Uh, the one thing that you've got to remember is this could be a systemic disease and uh, not a localized problem. And multiple sclerosis can sometimes actually start with symptoms in the hands and the shoulders. And you may think of thoracic outlet, but eventually these are progressive diseases and other nerves will get involved as well. So remember the differential diagnosis in an exam. Please do not jump onto TOS. Please tell a differential diagnosis when you discuss the thing. And then you talk about various investigations before you zoom onto a clinical diagnosis of thoracic outlet syndrome. Okay. The other thing could be there could be brachial plexitis, as, uh, that is inflammation of the brachial plexus. This could be a shoulder pathology. This could not be a thoracic outlet pathology at all. There could be uh, some problem within the shoulder joint, which is giving rise to similar pains. It could be fibromyalgia. So it could be a pathology of the muscle, not the nerve, not the vessels. It could be just a muscle problem or it could be Raynaud's or it could be a vasculitis problem. So Raynaud's syndrome may actually sometimes mask itself as a thoracic outlet syndrome. And last but not the least, pain in the neck and pain in the shoulder and pain in the arm could be angina. For God's sake, uh, you know, keep that in mind. In fact, that should be first diagnosis if you're dealing with an elderly patient who suddenly comes up with these uh, symptoms. Don't put a patient of angina through all these tests and try to diagnose thoracic outlet syndrome. So keep your mind open. There are a lot of other pathologies which could be causing these problems. Okay, now let's talk about how will you investigate a patient who's got thoracic outlet syndrome. The first and foremost is chest x-ray and x-ray of the neck. Don't forget that this is the basic investigation. The x-ray of the neck will show you any pathologies in the spine and it's got to be AP and lateral. Uh, you might see osteophytes in, the, in this uh, cervical column. A lot of things can come up on an x-ray neck and might not actually lead to a di diagnosis of thoracic outlet. Chest x-ray is very important because chest x-ray will show you a, either a pancos tumor, it will show you fracture of the um, clavicle. More importantly, a chest x-ray will show you presence of a cervical rib. So it's important to identify uh, a cervical rib. Of course, if it's a fibrous band, then you will not see uh, anything on the chest x-ray. But a chest x-ray and x-ray of the neck is the first investigation that you have to do in a thoracic outlet syndrome. Many a times in the FRCS exams, I've had students who come in and start talking about MR and geography of the thoracic outlet. And don't mention the first investigation, which is an X-ray of the cervical spine. And that is not good for FRCS. You cannot start off with MRIs of the thoracic outlet until and unless you mention uh, C-spine and chest X-ray. Of course, a CT scan is very helpful. Diagnostic uh, helps you pick out other pathologies. So a lot of things can be excluded by doing a CT scan. Uh, very often, actually, these uh, compressions are not picked up by a normal CT. So you have to do what is called as a dynamic CT angiography, which means that you do, uh, you give the dye and you shoot the film with the patient in neutral position 
and then you repeat the CT with the patient in uh, the position which causes uh, the symptoms to appear. So when the patient moves the arm, then you will actually see a compression or a stenosis of the subclavian artery or the subclavian vein. And so you actually reproduce the stenosis on the CT table. So the word is not just angiography, but the word is dynamic CT angiography, which means you change the position of the shoulder to repeat the angiography. MRI is very, very useful in these things, particularly MRI of the C-spine to rule out any spinal problems, uh, MRI of the thoracic outlet to see for uh, any soft tissue ab abnormalities, to see for any tumors, but more importantly, the MRI is very sensitive for looking at the brachial plexus and also for looking at the subclavian artery and the subclavian vein. So MRI still remains one of, one of the main diagnostic features of thoracic outlet. But it should not be the first investigations to be done in uh, clinical analysis of a patient. Of course, all these patients must have nerve conduction studies, uh, particularly to look at the various roots of the brachial plexus and to identify which root or which uh, part of the brachial plexus is getting damaged. So not just the brachial plexus, you've also got to look at the distal peripheral nerves in the nerve conduction, including the median nerve, the ulnar nerve. So it's quite important to do a complete nerve conduction test of the whole arm. And electromyography is, is important. Electromyography gives you additional information about the, uh, about the movements of the muscles, particularly the scalene muscles, and the uh, subclavius muscles. So it's quite important to use EMG as a diagnostic tool for thoracic outlet syndromes. When you're dealing with a venous situation where there is an acute problem or a chronic venous problem, then Doppler takes preference over all other investigations. So duplex ultrasound has got a very high sensitivity and very high specificity for venous diseases. So if, if you've got ischemic changes, even before you do a C spine or a chest x-ray, I would actually get a duplex ultrasound done because these are usually emergencies and you really want to crack on with it. A CT MR venography is also indicated when you're looking at venous pathologies of the thoracic outlet syndrome. Of course, don't forget about contrast venography where you inject the contrast into the vein and you track it uh, along its movement into the, uh, into the subclavian uh, vein. But this test has to be done at various levels of movement. Abduction, abduction is the one that you need to do. So it's done at 90 degrees and at 180 degrees. And the, 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 uh, the tracking of the dye is done to reproduce the compression of the vein under the three areas that we showed. All of these should include a coagulation screen. So routine testing has to be done, but particularly when you're dealing with a vascular problem, particularly when you're dealing with a venous, uh, uh, venous uh, thrombosis of the subclavian or the axillary artery, don't forget systemic coagula coagulopathies. Uh, and uh, so it's very, very, very important to do a coagulation screen to rule out systemic coagulopathy or hypercoagulable status. And sometimes you might actually find that the problem is a pancreatic cancer rather than a problem in the subclavian artery or vein. So every uh, subclavian uh, vein or axillary vein thrombosis does not mean that you've got a thoracic outlet syndrome. You could have systemic malignancy causing hypercoagulable status, and that may be actually causing the axillary vein thrombosis. Or you could have a cancer of the breast, which is causing axillary vein thrombosis. Particularly looking at subclavian artery uh, pathologies, uh, we have three types of problems. One could be an aneurysm. One could be uh, sorry. One could be an aneurysm. One could be a stenosis, or one could be complete occlusion. So there could be complete occlusion, stenosis, or there could be aneurysms. Very often, you might even find pseudo aneurysms of the subclavian artery. And that is why you have to do an angiography. It's very important to do an angiography and the angiography should be a dynamic CT angiography. And as you can see here, 
there is compression of the subclavian artery. Very clearly you can see there is compression of the subclavian artery. And as you go distally, the compression is relaxing. So you start off compression and there. In this, you create the compression by asking the patient to move the hand up or down, depending on whatever is the level. Now this is a, a, an anatomical compression. So this is where there is actually a cervical rib present, which is actually compressing the subclavian artery and causing the patient problems. And then very often we do what is called as digital subtraction and geography. So when you're talking in an exam, please talk of all these modalities. Don't forget MR, don't forget uh, angiography, don't forget dynamic angiography, but most people forget a digital subtraction angiography. A digital subtraction angiography actually is CT angiography minus all the other structures. So you specifically look at the vessel and see what is the status of the vessel, whether it's stenosed, compressed, or occluded. Uh, <clears throat> so we've talked about how to diagnose. We've reached a stage where we actually know now what is the pathology for these patients. So what about a neurological tracheo, uh, thoracic outlet uh, syndrome? What is the treatment? The first and foremost treatment, and in fact, in 90% of the people, the treatment is education education. You've got to treat the patient according to the problem. So you've got to look at the posture of the patient. You've got to look at the lifestyle of the patient, whether is he a computer IT guy, is he typing a lot and things like that. So you've got to re-educate the patient. You've got to get him to do posture correction. Sometimes in heavy uh, overweight patients, you advise them to have weight loss because losing the weight will actually reduce the fat within that area and make the joints more supple and more mobile. So you actually got to get the patient to exercise. And uh, there is a role for Botox injection of the scalene muscles, pectoralis minor muscles, and the subclavius muscles. I'll talk more in detail about this in a minute. But what you're trying to do is relax these muscles so that the contraction goes away. Okay, but the mainstay of treatment of neurological thoracic outlet syndrome, the mainstay is physiotherapy. 90% of patients will actually improve with simple physiotherapy. It's really, really, really important. Don't talk of surgery in the exam straight away. Please do not do that. You have to talk about posture correction, occupational correction, which means typing, less typing. You got to talk about weight loss, but please, please, please talk about physiotherapy because this is actually the main treatment for neuro neurological thoracic outlet syndrome. So you've got to ask the patient to learn relaxation exercises and practice abdominal breathing rather than thoracoabdominal breathing. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to relax the diaphragm. The patient has to learn how to relax the diaphragm. And when the diaphragm relaxes, the whole uh, chest wall comes down and the compression of the first rib is reduced. So you can teach the patient how to do abdominal breathing. In our setup, we can also teach them how to do yoga. Yoga exercises are very, very good for neurological thoracic outlet syndromes. Uh, stretching exercises of the neck and shoulder are very important. The muscles have to be retrained. Each of the muscle has to be uh, retrained how to stretch and how to relax. When you stretch the muscle, you release the contraction. And by releasing the contraction, you, you re re release the compression of the neurovascular bundle. Uh, you have to teach the patient to do what is called as nerve gliding exercises. And these are shoulder exercises which are specific for um, neurological thoracic outlet syndrome. And you've got to do what is called as strengthening exercises. So the neck muscles has to be strengthened, the chest muscles have to be strengthened so that they do not um, you know, cause the thoracic thing to fall down and compress the uh, neurovascular structures. So this is very, very, very important. 90% of patients will actually benefit with these things and the symptoms may either go away or reduce dramatically, so much so that the patient may not actually want any surgical intervention. Uh, I was talking about the Botox. The Botox, you can do this. You have to use a a syringe with an EMG guided thing. So here is a syringe and there's an EMG guided probe. So you push the syringe in into that muscle. 
specifically you identify which is the muscle which is causing excessive contraction or excessive pro problems and then you inject that muscle uh, under EMG guidance and this is a new technique that is available uh, in the market for uh, thoracic outlet syndromes. You'll find there's a lot of uh, different uh, non-surgical uh, techniques which are available uh, in the market. Uh, many, many different machines have come in which are specifically designed for uh, strengthening and exercising and relaxing the, uh, outlet, uh, the muscles of the neck. So let's come to surgery. Let's talk about uh, what are the indications for surgery. For me, I will never offer a patient surgery straight away. Never, ever. I always put patients through at least three to six months of conservative management. After they have had conservative management, they will then come to me and they will say, actually, I have not improved. If anything, the pain has got worse and my day-to-day -day life has been affected. The most important thing for me is day -to the quality of life assessment. Remember yesterday we did hyperhidrosis. We spoke about quality of life. So it's very important to use an SF36 chart or use various uh, quality of life assessment to find out what is the percentage of quality of life that is affected. And if anything is more than 50%, then these are candidates who you will consider for surgery. And also, of course, you, most of these pa patients have taken a whole gamut of pain medications and you've tried a whole lot of things, including patches and things like that and the pain is still not controlled with medication, then this is a guy who I will consider for surgery. The only people who I consider for urgent surgeries are the ones who have got a vascular compromise of the limb. Those are the only ones where I will consider urgent surgery. Otherwise, all other patients are actually designed to have conservative management and not surgery. So there are two or three approaches to surgery and I'll take you through each one of this approach. As a thoracic surgeon, the easiest approach for you is a trans axillary approach. This is an anatomy that you're familiar with. This is part of the chest wall. You are leaving the subclavian artery, the subclavian vein and the brachial plexus outside the surgical zone. Okay, that is why the transaxillary, when you come transaxillary, you come from here and you up directly hit the first rib. All the structures are here, they are going up. So they are beyond the limits of your surgery. Of course, you've got to be careful and make sure that you don't damage anything. But transaxillary approach gives you a direct access to the rib straight away without having to go between the neurovascular structures. So what you do is you, 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 this is the first rib here and these are the muscles that you want to get to and you want to cut the muscles, you want to cut the subclavius muscle, so you cut these two muscles, you cut this muscle and you cut the first rib, okay? But you're not touching any of the neurovascular bundles and all of the surgery is done on the first rib. So you, this is the uh, clavicle, so you come from the side, hit the first rib. Moment you hit the first rib, you see the attachment of the muscle, you dissect that. You see the attachment of this subclavius muscle, you cut it off. You see the attachment of the middle subclavius muscle, uh, middle scalene muscle, you cut that. All of the surgery is done on the first rib. In fact, sometimes even subperiosteally on the first rib. So all the neurovascular structures are lying outside the limits of the surgery. So there is very little chance that you will damage anything coming from a transaxillary route. So the patient is put sideways, the hand is stretched upwards like this. You make your incision, about one and a half to two inches incision. You get in there and when you open the, uh, the muscles, uh, you will actually directly hit the first rim. I'll show you what it is. When you open the muscle, what's happened is there is really not much muscle. There's latissimus on this side. Uh, sorry. There is latissimus on the back and there is pectoralis in the front. And there is really no other structure between the two. You just straight get in there and the first structure you hit is the rib. Can you see that? So coming from the side, you actually come along the chest wall and you hit the first rib. 
Look at subclavian, artery, subclavian, vein, and brachial patches. They are actually on the other side of the operative field. So there is less risk of damaging them. And then once you've done that, you make a cut on these muscles. You're cutting the subclavius muscle, you're cutting the anterior scalene muscle, you're cutting the middle scalene muscles, and then you make a cut on the first rib. So you made a cut here, you made a cut here. This cut is actually on the costal margin. So you also cut what is called as the costo, uh, costoclavicular ligament. So this is the subclavius muscle. You also cut the costoclavicular ligament and you make a cut on the cartilage of the first rib where it is joining the uh, menubrium sterni. And at the back, you make a cut as posterior as possible. You must not leave a sharp edge of the uh, posterior first rib. You have to nibble everything back. So you really have to nibble and make this blunt because this sharp edge can then rub against the nerve. And that is not something that you want. And then you take away the first rib. So all that is left behind outside into the chest and going into the hand is the neurovascular bundle. And then of course you, um, you, you, you do uh, physiotherapy after surgery and get the patient to rehabilitate. The other approach is called a supraclavicular approach. Now for supraclavicular approach, you really need to know the anatomy very well because you are going to go between the brachial plexus and the subclavian artery and the subclavian vein because Approaching from the top, the first rib lies beyond the neurovascular structures. That is the most important thing to understand. Sometimes you have to combine a supraclavicular with an infraclavicular uh, incision. So in a supraclavicular incision, you, you have to first come in and deal with all these neurovascular structures, move them aside, and then get to the first rib. So you are making the patient lie down there is a, a shoulder roll. You mark out the anterior border of the sternocleidomastoid, mark out the clavicle, and then you make this incision supraclavicularly. So once you've made the incision in the supraclavicular fossa, the first structure that you will see is the platysma. Once you are seen the platysma, you incise the platysma. And the next structure that you see below the platysma is the sternocleidomastoid muscle. Once you've seen the sternocleidomastoid muscle, you move it to one side. This is the sternocleidomastoid. You've dissected it and moved it to one side of the incision. If you're on the right side, it will move to the right side. If you're on the left side, it will move to the left side. Whichever side, it is moved to the medial side of the incision. Whether it's the right or the left, you move the sternocleidomastoid away to the medial side. The moment you move the sternocleidomastoid away, the next structure you see is the anterior scalene pad fat. The important thing to remember about this scalene pad fat is that it has got a lot of lymphatics supplying this uh, pad fat. So you have to actually look for the lymphatics. And particularly on the left side, you got to make sure that you do not damage the thoracic duct as it comes and drains into the subclavian junction. So very important, don't just chop through the fat. You have to actually ligate sometimes all these uh, 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 thoracic, uh, all these lymphatics which are leaking. So you don't want to give a seroma or a lymphoma, uh, sorry, not a lymphoma, a seroma in the wound. And that is why it's very important to ligate all these ducts. You don't want a chylothorax or a chylus leakage. Once you are there, then once you've taken this pad fat away, that's where the action starts now. Now you've got to look for various structures. You've got to look for the subclavian vein, which is lying here. You have to look for the internal jugular vein, which is lying uh, to the right side. Here is the brachial plexus. Here is the subclavian artery. And this is the scalene muscle. So as soon as you take the pad fat off, the next structure that you see in front of you is the anterior scalene muscle. Traditionally, the IJV and the phrenic nerve will go to the right side. You got, it will move away from your structure, depending on which side you're operating, right or left, but it will move to the medial side of the structure. And the brachial plexus and the subclavian artery will be in the lateral side. Once you've lifted up the pad fad, you see the anterior scalene muscle, you actually 
dissect the anterior scalene and chop it off. You've got to take care of the phrenic nerve. The phrenic nerve lies in close approximation to the internal jugular vein. So you have to move the phrenic nerve to one side. You don't want to paralyze the diaphragm and you make a cut on the scalene nerve. The moment you make a cut on the anterior scalene muscle, not the nerve, the anterior scalene muscle, you lift it up, then you will see the subclavian artery and the brachial plexus as it is running uh, between the anterior scalene muscle and the middle scalene muscle. You have to make sure that you move the nerves and the arteries to one side. Also remember there is a long thoracic nerve of bell which runs along the brachial plexus. So you've got to identify these structures. So the important structures, I'll repeat it again, is you've got to identify the IJV to, to the medial side, the phrenic nerve to one side, you've got to identify the axillary vein on the lateral side, you cut the anterior scalene muscle, then you will see the subclavian artery, you will see the brachial plexus, you will see the long thoracic nerve, and behind the long thoracic nerve lies the middle scalene muscle. You have to actually chop across the middle scalene muscle. And once you've done that, then you have to physically move the brachial plexus to one side, the subclavian artery to the other side. So you go between the brachial plexus and the subclavian artery and you make a cut on the posterior end of the rib, as posterior as possible. Remember the little stub that you keep behind, you've got to nibble all of that uh, bone off so that there is no sharp end which will rub against the brachial plexus. Uh, sometimes through this area, you might actually be able to dissect medially on the first rib and cut the first rib <coughs> at the costoclavicular junction. But uh, very often you're not able to get medial enough because of these important structures. And if that's the case, then you go infraclavicularly, you make a second incision below there. The moment you make an infraclavicular incision, the first muscle you will see is the pectoralis major muscle. The moment you dissect between the fibers of the pectoralis major muscle, you will see the first rib, the medial end of the first rib, and two more muscles you will see. That is the, cost, the, that is the subclavius muscle and the costoclavicular ligament. Remember I said something about subclavius muscle which lies below the uh, clavicle? That attaches to the medial border of the first rib. So you cut the subclavius muscle, you cut the, uh, the costoclavicular ligament, see this costoclavicular ligament, and then you cut the cartilage of the first rib. You really try to take it out as close to the sternum as possible. And then once you've done that, you deliver the first rib out and you will get a, you'll get, uh, you know, a relief of symptoms. Obviously, this takes, after surgery, the patient has to have extreme amount of physiotherapy. Very quickly, you mobilize the patient and start physiotherapy of the shoulder girdle. And uh, the results of the surgery will be known about uh, six weeks to three months following the surgery. There is, uh, if you have recurrence of symptoms and, uh, you, you know, the, there is a problem, then you cannot approach from the front because once you've operated in the front, you, you, you really cannot approach from the front. So for recurrent thoraco, uh, thoracic outlet syndrome, if you think there is something else which is in addition causing compression, then the approach is from the back, a very high posterior thoracotomy and get into the first rib and then do that. Most people do not use the posterior approach for the first time. Most, most of us as thoracic surgeons will go trans -axillary. Uh, quite a few uh, vascular surgeons prefer to go uh, from the supraclavicular route and then some surgeons for better excision and safer excision go supra and infraclavicular. Nowadays, um, there is increasing uh, evidence uh, in literature for going the other way. Rather than going from the chest wall, why not go from inside the chest wall? Once you go inside the pleural cavity, then you are approaching the first rib directly. And there is really nothing between you and the first rib. All the structures are outside the first rib. So it's a very safe uh, 
area and visibility is excellent. You see really, really well. In fact, nowadays I personally dock the robot rather than uh, using vats. You can do it by vats or you can do it by robot and that will give you a very good view. Once you're in there with the robot, the topmost rib beyond the obvious visible rib is the first rib. The first rib lies outside the visibility of the thoracic uh, area. So you've got to actually make an incision on the pleura. The moment you make an incision on the pleura, you can feel the rib outside the uh, thoracic cavity. And then you start making a horizontal buzz mark on the rib uh, to come medially and laterally. Medially, because there's a costal cartilage, it's very easy to just cut through the uh, costal cartilage with your uh, robotic um, diathermy probe. Uh, laterally, you may be able to cut it with the diathermy, but occasionally we use a long instrument. So you've got to undock the robot and put in a long rib cutter, which is called as a sophomore's rib cutter. And I'll show you that in a minute. The important thing is as long as you are within the periosteum of the rib, if you peel the periosteum off, then all the neurovascular structures lie outside the periosteum beyond the first rib. So when you access it from within the chest, you only see the rib. You don't need to see the uh, subclavian artery, subclavian vein, and the uh, brachial plexus. So it, it, it is uh, a relatively safer uh, approach, but it needs great experience to know exactly where you're doing because a little bit of buzzing in the wrong area and you will end up with a massive bleed from the subclavian artery or vein. And the problem is you are not uh, in a position to control that bleed immediately. So that is something that you've got to keep in mind when you're doing endoscopic first rib resections, because if bleeding happens, then you are actually A, if you're robotic, then you're not at the table. And B, there is no access to the subclavian artery from within the pleura. Uh, if you have done a subclavian, uh, supraclavicular incision, then you can easily access the subclavian artery and get proximal and distal control. So it's very, very important that when you do robotic first rib resection, you must prepare paint and drape and expose the supra and the infraclavicular area very clearly so that anything goes wrong, you, you're ready to make an incision and uh, get proximal and distal control. So once you've done that, then you uh, just get in there. So there are a lot of people who are now starting increasingly to show videos of uh, resection of the first rib. Uh, again, as I said, uh, most of the structures lie outside the periosteum and outside the thoracic uh, area. So you don't really need to worry about them, but dissection has to be very, very careful. Okay, and this is the so this is a uh, this is an endoscopic rib cutter. This is the one made by Scanlon, and this is the sort of instruments that you have to keep uh, ready. So not only do you cut the rib, you also got to have a bone nibbler. It's very important to have a bone nibbler because you need to nibble out all the raw, um, uh, sharp edges of the first rib to make sure that you're not leaving anything behind to damage the subclavian artery vein and more importantly the brachial plexus because they can cause because remember after you have released the compression the anatomy changes the configuration of the anatomy changes and these vessels tend these neurovascular structures tend to drop down so initially they are outside the thoracic cavity but because all the compression is gone they actually drop down and so your edges of the first rib will be right onto the subclavian artery and the subclavian vein so very very important to make sure there are no sharp edges of the first rib to cause a problem. Complications following thoracic, following the surgery, you can get pneumothorax, no big deal. You just put in a drain and deal with it. But more importantly is vascular injuries. That is why uh, people actually go supraclavicularly because when you go supraclavicularly, you can get, get control of the subclavian artery and vein. When you go transaxillary, subclavian artery and vein are beyond your reach. They are outside of your operative field. So if you do damage uh, any of these structures, it's almost impossible to control it from a transaxillary or a transpleural route. Impossible. So some people, that's why they go supraclavicularly because even though you're dissecting, if you're familiar with that area, you, 
you, you still have access to the subclavian artery and vein to get proximal and distal control. I personally, when I go supraclavicularly, I work with my plastic surgeon, who is a world-renowned plastic surgeon in brachial plexus surgery. He does brachial plexus day in, day out in that area. So whenever I do a supraclavicular approach, I actually take him along with me. And between the two of us, we identify all of the structures. He dissects up to the first rib, and then I take over and I uh, reset the rib and I do whatever else I need to do. Uh, I cut those muscles and things, but he dissects the neurovascular bundle for me. And that is uh, one good way of doing a conjoint surgery. Of course, you can get nerve injuries. I showed you the pathology very clearly. I showed you the anatomy very clearly. There are three nerves which can get injured. One is the phrenic on the medial border of your incision. There is the long thoracic, which runs between the media, uh, anterior scalene and the med middle scalene. And there is a brachial plexus. So any of these can be injured. Very often on table when we are operating, we will have uh, EMG stimulator, nerve stimulator, present on table. So before we retract anything, we will actually stimulate that nerve to make sure that it's a nerve because it, it's sometimes it's not so easy to identify. Sorry? Hello? Are we okay? I heard somebody say somebody. Okay. The other nerve that you could damage is the sympathetic chain. And sometimes when you're operating on the left side, you might get a lymphatic leak. Uh, is everybody with me or is it getting too much? I, I don't understand. Somebody said something. It's going on good, sir. Okay, good. Let's good, see. sir. It's going good, yeah. Good. It's fine. Good, sir. So, yeah. the thing that you could get is lymphatic leak on the left side because the, uh, because the thoracic duct comes and uh, joins the junction of the uh, internal jugular and the subclavian uh, vein. And you've got to be careful about, about that area. You've got to be aware that you might actually damage the Okay, what is the success rate of surgery? <clears throat> For neurological success rates, it's about 70% at five years. Okay, so very, very good outcomes. Once you take away the first rib, very, very good outcomes. 20 to 30% uh, known cases of recurrence. And if the patient has recurrence, then uh, you have to try conservative management again. You should not try to reoperate. So it's very important to try conservative management. Uh, the, um, uh, the arterial and the venous thoracic outlets have very high success rate because obviously you are taking away an acute uh, obstruction of a vascular structure and that gives you very good outcomes. What about recurrence surgery? Uh, all recurrence should be treated with physiotherapy. It's absolutely important. Reoperations have very poor success, uh, very poor success rates. So you have to think hundred times before you reoperate. I personally would never go in and reoperate unless there's something very, very obvious which I've missed. Uh, you can try Botox in these patients and try to release the muscles, or uh, you can do contralateral surgery if the patient's got bilateral problems. But usually, as I said earlier. You do one side at a time. Don't do both sides at the, th at the same time. Completely, completely not acceptable to operate both sides at the same time. You do one side at a time, give physiotherapy, look at the benefits to the patient, and the opposite side, you operate the next year. So as far as possible, you try to do uh, the two sides separate, okay? Uh, venous, thrombo, uh, venous thoracic outlet syndrome has... Uh, the same sort of uh, diagram, we spoke about the uh, venograms and duplex. Uh, one thing additional in this is venothrom venous thrombolysis. So you've got to think about venous thrombolysis, whether you do it before the surgery or sometimes you might have to operate and then thrombolyze the patient. So it is important to look at venous thrombolysis for these patients. Uh, increasingly, we are seeing uh, patients with the uh, Vascular problems being treated with endovascular problems. So for the, for the vascular uh, uh, TOS, the, these are the principles. You have to do removal of a bony abnormalities. You might have to reconstruct the artery. Very often you might find there's a narrowing or complete obstruction and you might have to put in an interposition graph uh, to the subclavian artery. Uh, and sometimes if there is embolus distally, you might have to use a Fogarty's and do a distal embolectomy for these, for these patients. 
uh, open surgery was traditionally done uh, in the olden days uh, where we would do subclavian artery reconstruction. But nowadays, increasingly, this work has gone endovascularly. So a lot of people are actually doing endovascular stenting for stenosis and then doing the, uh, doing the uh, rib part at a second sitting. So sort out the vascular problem initially and then do the rib part if required. Uh, and then a lot of people are doing endovascular stenting for subsequent aneurysms because sometimes these guys develop pseudo aneurysms of the subclavian artery or the subclavian vein. Uh, these are the sort of articles that are coming out in the literature for, uh, for subclavian artery reconstruction using endovascular uh, stuff. So the bottom line is uh, thoracic outlet syndrome has a neurological component and a vascular component. Conservative management is the main stay of treatment. Do not operate on every single uh, thoracic outlet guy that comes across you. In fact, your surgery rate should be less than 10%. 90% of them actually resolve with uh, physiotherapy. Surgery has a definitive role in these things. And important thing is you offer emergency surgery only when there is a vascular complication when the limb is threatened or life is threatened. Thank you. Oh God, that was a long one. Okay, stop share. All <laughs> right. Okay, guys, uh, video recording this much. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, okay. So now it's time for us to take questions. Who wants to ask me questions? Did it make sense, guys? Yes, sir. Yes, yes, sir. Yes. Yes, sir. Probably the most exhaustive review of, uh, of, uh, of thoracic artery syndrome. You wouldn't find so much <laughs> everywhere. But I've gone through everything. I've covered it completely, actually. There's nothing left now for me to do. Okay? Uh, I have one. Uh, okay, one more. Uh, what about your... no, Just one minute, because. Uh, yes. Uh, Asavari, Hello. Asavari, are you live with me? Asavari, are you live with me? Okay, Asavari is not there. Just one minute. That is not coming up. So there are a huge number of questions which Asavari has sent me because we are live on other channels. Uh, Okay, so first you ask your question, uh, Vikas, and then I'll go through these questions which Asavari uh, has uh, asked. Go ahead. So when, when you are doing it from supraclavicular approach, do yeah. you do neurolysis uh, routinely, uh, releasing the covering on the nerves, the brachial plexus? That it should be done routinely. Um, Actually, the real problem is a physical, uh, physical obstruction of the rib and the muscle. And once you've cut the muscle and you've cut the rib, I think you're okay. I personally try not to fiddle with the nerves because I, I worry that I will give some, uh, uh, you know, problems to the nerves uh, in terms of, uh, you know, neuro, neuropraxia and things like that. So I am very worried about, uh, uh, about uh, the the nerves. So I just stay far away from them. Yes. Unless there is an indication or I can see obviously a pathology, I will not touch the nerve. And uh, uh, like uh, dividing dividing the costoclavicular ligament, can we do it through transaxillary axillary approach also? The costoclavicular ligament? Yes, you can. Yes, you can. You yeah. have to be very anterior for it. You really so, have to be it. When The costoclavicular ligament gets cut when you cut the first rib on the cartilage. Wherever okay. there's a cartilage, the costoclavicular. So landmark is cartilage. We have to reach the cartilage. Yeah, you have to reach the cartilage. You must try and reach anteriorly the cartilage. So we have said two inches, but it doesn't matter. You can extend the incision if you want. Mm -hmm. it's, it's all about access. So if it's a huge patient or a fat, bulky patient, then axillary approach is a pain in the yeah. because uh, you know there's a lot of fat on the chest wall, breast, and all that. So you decide on that. Okay. Okay. My 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 thinking was that the supraclavicular and infraclavicular combined is the easier approach. Easier, yeah. I'm telling. You. It is. It is the easier. Yeah. It is the easier approach because you have more control over the situation. You're absolutely right, but you really need to know the anatomy. 
Yes, sir. Yes. Thoracic surgeons are not comfortable with the anatomy of the supraclavicular area and the infraclavicular area. It's not something that you do every day. So that's why I personally actually take my plastic surgeon with me. He does brachial plexus every day, morning, evening. So why should I take a chance? You know, I don't know exactly where is the long thoracic nerve of Bell or where is the small subclavian nerve and uh, supraclavicular nerve and all that. So I take him with me and he, he identifies everything and beautifully dissects it. It takes him 10 minutes to get to the first step. So it doesn't matter. Uh I am not yet finished. <laughs> One more question. Okay. Uh, you 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 said you said about endovascular that we go ahead and do the stenting first and tackle the the. I I read somewhere that unless you have taken care of the obstruction, you should not go and doing endovascular. So you should go ahead with the surgery first <laughs> no, and release the obstruction. How first. acute is the symptom? How acute is the symptom? That's the important thing. Okay. If it's an acute symptom, then you need to sort out the vessel as okay. soon as possible. Okay, sir. Okay, somebody is asking me a few questions. Um, morning, sir. Uh, who's that? Hello, sir. Yeah, hi, sir. Sir, Shilpa. Yeah. Uh, so I have a couple of basic questions, exam-oriented, uh, sort of. So first of all, you enlisted all the tests. So do we need to perform all of them while uh, yeah. doing the case? Yeah, yeah, as many as possible. This is the best case okay. to have for the exam. I'm telling you, because you spend time I... doing all the tests really quickly, uh, and uh, once you've practiced, you really can go through the test in less than five minutes. But it, you do things rather than having a case where you don't have many things to do, like hyperhidrosis. You know, there's not that many uh, tests that you can do on the hand. So this is the best case to have in an exam. Okay. Now, one minute, Shilpa. I'm going to take some clinical questions which are coming from other platforms. Okay. So le let me take those okay. clinical questions and then we'll take the exam questions. So I've got, uh, I've got uh, Dr. Yatin Ghosh asking me about rotator cuff pathology. Yes, uh, I did mention in my talk uh, that uh, shoulder pathology actually is one of the differential diagnoses of, uh, of this uh, surgery. Uh, somebody has asked me, Dr. Chandrasekhar Kerudi is asking me, standard cost of an effective investigation. Uh, costs are a very, uh, very difficult uh, concept to judge because it changes from country to country. But uh, the best investigation and the most important investigation for the neck is the MR angiography. I personally do not operate on uh, patients with brachial plexus compressions without having an MR angiography. So whatever is the cost of uh, the uh, whatever is the cost of the uh, uh, you know uh, MR angiography changes from institution to institution. So I don't have the exact numbers. Uh, so uh, you'll just have to find out your local pathology. Dr. Jahura Ahmed Patankar is asking me. Can it be done by minimal invasive access and what is the port placement? Uh, yes, uh, Dr. Jaur Ahmad, it can be done by minimal access surgery. I did show in my talk that you can do it by VAX uh, uh, intrapleural approach uh, and robotic intrapleural approach. I have two times tried to do a trans axillary approach by uh, robotic. Uh, which is extra thoracic. But both the times, uh, my problem with the robotic was that I could not get uh, a rib cutter long enough to cut the rib uh, via the ro on the robotic platform. So both the times, in fact, I was once with, uh, with uh, Robert Serfolio uh, when we were doing it, and he's one of the leaders in robotics across the world. And both of us were operating, and we tried to do an extra thoracic uh, trans axillary approach, but I really couldn't get a rib cutter long enough to reach out to there. But now, with the new endoscopic rib cutters available, maybe we could try to do a trans axillary uh, robotic uh, resection. It's not been done as yet. Uh, Dr. Jawar Mahmud Patankar is also asking me. If exposure is bad in supraclavicular approach, uh, if exposure is not ideal, would it help to transect the clavicular incision of the sternocleidomastoid? 
uh, yes, you can actually dissect the sternocleidomastoid uh, and uh, cut it, but most of the times, to be really honest, I have never had to do that because the that is too medial. You're, you're operating uh, pretty lateral. So you really don't need to be able to, you don't need to cut the clavicular incision. But of course, it is, it's not a problem because the, you're not actually uh, compromising the sternocleidomastoid if you do cut the clavicular incision. Uh, that's not a problem. Uh, yes, another question is how to differentiate between a recurrence and inadequate primary surgery. It's a very difficult uh, uh, situation. Uh, you, really, um, you really need to uh, investigate these people thoroughly. Uh, MR uh, can actually give you an idea whether you've left behind some uh, uh, stump of the first rib or whether uh, there has been fibrosis and things like that. Uh, so MR is, is a good tool to look for recurrence. Uh, one of the other things which commonly occurs is you have actually missed uh, a fibrosis, a cervical fibrous band. So you went in, you took out the first rib, but you didn't realize that there is actually a fibrous band. And if that is the state, then uh, repeat MR angiography will show you the fibrous band compressing the, uh, the vessel. And, and so you need to go back in and cut off that fibrous band. So most of the recurrences uh, uh, of surgical inadequacy is because you didn't re realize that there is a fibrous band. Uh, okay, and thank you and very comprehensive. Good. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, sir Asavari. Thank you so yeah. much for answering all lab bro viewers' questions. Thank you, sir. I hope really it's going well, Asavari. I have got yes. some questions on... Uh, WhatsApp, uh, somebody else asked me a question one second ago. Who, sure. uh, who else asked me a question? I just saw somebody asking me a question. Uh, sorry, just one second. Uh, there was one question. Who was that? Ramaswamy was asking me. So should we, pre we, should we be prepared for median sternotomy, for right subclavian artery control, and left thoracotomy for left subclavian artery control in case of vascular injuries? Uh, the answer to this is actually, if you, in a supraclavicular approach, you uh, you can control the subclavian artery because it's right there in front of you, uh, and and you, you you can very easily get uh, medial uh, control and lateral control. But there's nothing wrong in being prepared for a median sternotomy. Always always a good idea to be prepared for the worst uh, scenario. But personally, I've had uh, not had to do that. Um, I, I don't know, I've not read uh, any article where people have had to do a median sternotomy for uh, controlling the subclavian artery because you're right there and you can see it in front of you and, and you just have to go uh, sloop it uh, medially and laterally and you will get control because the injury will happen in front of you, never outside your view. This is not a surgery where you're using a lot of diathermy and things like that. So if you are in an open surgery, supraclavicular approach, you can do it. Uh, in a, in a <clears throat> venous uh, thromboembolism or in an, uh, sorry, the second question was left thoracotomy for left subclavian artery control. The thoracotomy will never give you access to the subclavian artery. I promise you, the subclavian artery lies outside the domain of the chest at the thoracic outlet. So if you do a thoracotomy, you are no way going to get control. If you do have to do that, then you have to do a sternotomy or, or you have to go supraclavicular to get control. From the chest, from inside the chest, you will never ever get control of the subclavian artery. There is no way you will see it. So it's a very difficult access. On, on left side, sir? Uh, on the left side as well. It's, it's so we, a, when, when we do period ligation, we routinely find that left side even there. Yeah, maybe you can. Yeah, so, yeah maybe you're right. Uh, but right side for sure, you cannot get into the yeah. subclavian artery from the chest. On the left side, yeah, maybe you're right, you can. Uh, but I haven't uh, come across these situations, uh, even in literature, where somebody has done a left thoracotomy for left subclavian artery control. Because really, it's not about subclavian artery. Once you've got bleed from the subclavian, you really need to go on bypass. You need to go... Uh, I would do a sternotomy rather than a thoracotomy because you don't have time for that. 
Okay, the next question is VTOS. Is the infraclavicular approach preferred? Uh, the infraclavicular is never done as an isolated approach. Usually, if you do want to do uh, uh, an approach, then it's always combined with a supraclavicular approach. So that is a standard one that people uh, prefer. Uh, I've got parts so long. Sir, one, yeah. one minute, one minute. Just let me do these uh, WhatsApp because I can't uh, go back to it. Why do you prefer MR angiography over CT angiography for investigation thoracic outlet syndrome? I am listening to you live on thoracic outlet. Okay, why do I prefer MR angiography? Well, to be honest, uh, because brachial plexus is best defined on an MR angiography. You can do a CT angiography, not a problem, but uh, CT angiography doesn't give you the definition of the, the clear cut de definition of the planes for brachial plexus. So I personally like to do MR angiography because I then understand the brachial plexus better uh, and in great depth. So it helps me to understand the anatomy better. Okay, now I have all the WhatsApp questions. Sir. Uh, one or two questions from the floor, and then Sir. we will have to. One minute, Simran Kundan has raised hands. So let's do the raise hands first. I'm sorry, Shilpa, I'm not trying to cut you off, uh, but uh, there's <laughs> still happening, and I'm trying to go between you. Okay. Good afternoon, sir. Fantastic presentation. Just a couple of uh, questions. Uh, one is a surgical, uh, one is an exam question, and one is a clinical question. The clinical question is how important do you? place emphasis on nerve conduction studies for your evaluation of the patients? Uh, if, if there are neural uh, pathologies, uh, then see, I, I work with a brachial plexus surgeon, uh, you okay. know, and I am very used to interpreting nerve conduction uh, tests. So I, I place a high reliance on the nerve conduction test because it tells me where exactly is the, is the compression. Is it in the lower root? Is it in the upper root? Uh, you know, so it kind of gives me an anatomical localization, if you know what I mean. So it's right. an indirect localization, but if it's an upper root, I know it's more likely to be the subclavius uh, pathology that's caused. Because here there are three separate areas of uh, constriction. Right. And it's right. very difficult to know where is it causing the compression. And so right. if and I know that it's the upper root and it's the subclavius, I will tackle the subclavius more aggressively. Uh, not okay. subclavius, and are there any guidelines for... Are there any guidelines for nerve conduction study as far as surgery is concerned, sir? Oh my God, I don't know this. Email me the question, Simran. I will look it up for you. Oh, fantastic. Thank you so much, sir. Second question is, sir, in the Royal College exam uh, practicals, how does the thoracic outlet uh, uh, topic come up? Uh, clinical case. Oh, and full case? Oh my God. Okay. Cervical, cervical rib. They will show you a x-ray or right. a study of a cervical rib or they will right. keep a patient with the things it's a very very good topic to discuss right sir. it's right. really because once you understand see since we are recording this um, you can keep going back to this video recording yes, and sir. keep looking everything step by step if you go through my slides i i don't see any reason why you should not understand Definitely. the anatomy and the pathology and so thank you so much for doing this it's really helpful thank you so much yeah one minute. else has raised the hand who has raised the hand Sir, uh, Vinita. Uh, Vinita, Vinita, tell me. Uh, sir, uh, I have one clinical question. If the patient's uh, problem is a uh, abnormal cervical rib, uh, then uh, usually we do excision of the cervical rib and cutting of the scalenus anterior and medius. Is it uh, mandatory that we should excise the first rib also in addition to this? Uh, personally, if I'm there, uh, I would take it out. <laughs> That's my take on it. Because uh, there is a risk of recurrence. So that's why I, if I'm there, I take out of it. I release the whole chain. And there is no loss of any physiological anatomy, uh, physiological movements of the shoulders. All of it comes back. So the muscles which you're cutting off really don't make a huge difference to the movement of the shoulder and things like that. So uh, if I'm there, I will do the whole thing. That's my philosophy in the management. But uh, if you are brave enough, you can do the just one half of the operation and leave the other half for a second uh, sitting. <laughs> but uh, most of these patients will not come back for the second sitting. Thank and there's no way of knowing on table what is going to help the patient. So if I'm there, I do the whole thing. I really clean it all out. Okay, okay sir, thank you. Sir. Shashigir near. Yeah, who is that? Uh, Shilpa wants Shashigir. to ask a question. One minute. Yeah. Shilpa, no problem. One question, please. Yes, yeah, sir. Okay. 
Who, who's asking? Can I ask? Yeah, yeah. yeah. okay. Uh, so only one question. Um, status of uh, nerve conduction velocity testing, especially in neurogenic TOS. It wasn't there in the slides, but it is mentioned in the books. It's one of the like the diagnostic uh, yeah. test or the confirmatory test. That's what I just. Yes. Said. So we need to actually mention I that in the investigations. Do, I always do nerve conduction studies in my patients, and I I, I and, uh, analyze uh, uh, the results. Yeah. Okay, and the most important last question is surgical approach. There are many. But uh, while answering the viva, so what do we say? The one which you are comfortable with, you have seen it and done it on your own, or all the, you know, all the appro approaches. Always talk of the one that you are comfortable with. So don't ever talk about VATS and robotic resection of first aid. Always talk of. Yeah, and the last. Comfortable with. Okay, and last question, which is just uh, for a, a clinical interest and academic interest, is you do a VATS or robotic first rib resection. So. Uh, how do you address the skeletotomy part of the surgery? No, the, that, that, that step, how do you address? No, you don't. You, you, you just you remove just, the first? You, you, you remove the first rib and uh, chop everything that's attached to the first rib. Yeah, that's the question. Okay. Thank you. Shashi Karan. Uh, sir, my question is, uh, when you're dividing the skeletonous muscle, especially the skeletonous medius, which is very near to the uh, brachial plexus, how do you divide it? Uh, you are going to use bipolar or are you going to use uh, uh, just a sharp cut on that because it, the other thing is you can have a good bleed from the muscles. Yeah, you use a, a, you use a retractor, sloop it around, lift it up, open it up and between the things you use a bipolar and uh, cut the muscle using a bipolar. That's the safest way to do it. Bipolar is the safest way to do it. Uh, otherwise, if you cut it, then it retracts and there's bleeding and all that. So bipolar uh, is, is, a, is a safe way to do it so that you don't touch the nerve. But always loop it and lift it up and always make sure there's something behind you. Don't touch your diathermy to the uh, metallic end. So try to use an insulated uh, instrument, uh, something with a rubber shot on it, lift it up and spread it. But always there is a there is a connection of the nerve conduction uh, to the to to the anesthetist, and and the moment you are buzzing here, you you keep an eye on what's happening on the nerve conduction to make sure you're not touching the uh, brachial plexus. Got to be very careful. You're right. You can damage. Two things can get damaged when you are cutting the middle uh, scalene muscle. One is the uh, long thoracic nerve of Bell, and the other one is the brachial plexus. <coughs> Next, sir, one, one, one more thing. Yeah. Uh, if you find a uh, pseudonymism on on table, I mean, preoperatively, you will obviously will be knowing it. So, what is going? What will be uh, the approach to that case? If there is a pseudonymism, I always get a vascular surgeon with me. Okay. I always. If we are going to repair. repair, repair, repair the... Most of the times, they may be able to repair it on the table. I have personally not come across uh, a case because pseudo aneurysm happens afterwards. Actually, most of the times, it's in a recurrence. But if you do have a pseudo aneurysm, you can do an end-to-end -end anastomosis. You can do a, uh, or or you can preoperatively put in a stent across it and then operate. Uh, there are many strategies for doing that, but I personally keep a vascular surgeon with me when I go in. I, I have no egos about, uh, about calling in experts for cases because these are not things that you do every day. Uh, so you, you need to have people who are experienced with you. And bottom line is that is what the patient wants. He just wants one surgery. He wants everything to go well. And he doesn't mind paying for it if an extra standby vascular surgeon comes. It's not a big deal yet. So Sir, uh, when, when, when you are excising the rib, you, you do the uh, periosteal elevation and you go up subperiosteally in, in all this, yeah, even in supracalicular approach, right, sir? In supracalicular approach, you are okay because it's in front of you and you can just chop it out. But uh, other, other, when you are coming from a compromised axis, then subperiosteal is better, safer. So for a beginner, it, it is better that we start from a supracalicular approach. Yeah, but the anatomy is very difficult. <laughs> you need to know the anatomy. I'll tell you, it looks very easy on these uh, animation videos, but even I shit when I go supraclavicularly because uh, it's not an area where you're operating every day. So, you know, one everything looks like a nerve. When you go in that little fibrous band from that muscle also looks like a nerve. So 
it's it's really scary that's why i take a plastic says me he shows me he tells me don't worry that's okay cut it off cut it cut it off everything looks like a nerve every time you go in there so it's not a easy anatomy you you got to be careful about what you do and the complication of it is quite severe for the patient you know anything you you damage the brachial plexus but it's a very popular approach yeah it is it is there are some people who do spinal cleft all the time people are doing yeah Uh, so I had a question. Yeah, there, there are a lot of questions on the chat. I'm just looking at it, and I think we have answered all of them. The video wasn't vis- visible. Was, was it visible eventually? Ah, uh, yes, sir. That was is that right. a bit later? Uh, is the roof test same as the east elevated arm test? Uh, no, it's a bit different. I'll tell you a little bit about it uh, in on the emails. what are the basic physiotherapy i i did uh, say to you there are four physiotherapy one is abdominal breathing one is uh, nerve gliding test and one is uh, uh, nerve relaxation uh, sorry muscle relaxation there there are uh, there's a whole chart available out there if you if you google it the, the the exercises are available and the pictures are shown of what is the exercises that are to be done okay so and uh, 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 is is it a routine practice to add dorsal sympathectomy when we are doing a redo for a recurrence i don't know the answer to this i i don't know my that 200 page, my 200 page notebook says i have written it from somewhere that if you are doing a redo no. you add i don't know the answer to this i don't know the answer to this and will we be asked to demonstrate all these relaxation exercises in exams is it possible no, not the physiotherapy exercises but the but the test you will be asked to demonstrate okay Okay. So, one minute. One minute, guys. Wait. Uh, because sir, sir, Amol here, sir. Uh, one minute, Amol. Just one minute. I'll take a question, Amol. Uh, because we are relaying on multiple platforms, uh, Vikas, if you wanted to discuss a case with me, the way we do it is we will switch off this transmission, and I'll send you another link. And whoever wants to join only for the case presentation can join in because this is for thoracic outlet syndrome. Let's do it that way. Amol, uh, please come in. Yes, sir. Uh, sir, uh, uh, some literature says that uh, exercising subperiodically may lead to higher recurrence rate because of bone growth, bone regrowth, sir. Correct. So, uh, so you what, do the subperiodical uh, resection, take away the rib, and then chop the periosteum off. Okay, okay, sir. And sir, how how much posteriorly we should go? Uh, as usually, it's a conclusion. Uh, no, no, as posteriorly as possible. You must go really up to the neck okay. of the rib. Really back. Okay. Okay. Mm-hmm. Really okay, back. Sir. Okay, sir. Okay. Get it off. Okay. Thank. Thank you, sir. Thank you. All right. Okay. So we have spent. Uh, what have we spent? Two hours and fifteen minutes on this uh, presentation. Okay. So thank you very much, everybody, and thank you for people on the live stream who have joined us uh, from all these various countries. Uh, it's been really a pleasure to. talk to you about a topic which is quite a difficult topic um but i hope uh, we have uh, helped you understand the anatomy and uh, i'm going to log off on this one and uh, if vikas you want to vikas come back on if you want to present then i am happy to send you uh, another link on thoracic gurus okay yes sir yes sir thank you very much thanks guys bye thank you thank you so much thank sir you, thank, you, thank you sir thank you so much thank you very much sir